Hello and good afternoon to everybody or those on the West Coast. Happy late morning to you and happy Earth Day to everybody. I am meteorologist Bernadette Woods Plackey and I'm joined by my colleague Sean Sublette and eventually by Richard Somerville. And today we're going to be discussing the history of climate change. Now, for those who are joining us via WSI or NWA, and aren't super familiar with Climate Central and, and what we do, just want to give you a two-second overview here. We are a nonprofit independent organization researching and reporting on the science and the impacts of climate change. And within the organization, we have a program called Climate Matters, where we partner with TV meteorologists to bring climate science into the weather cast. And here's an example of what we sent out yesterday. And for those who are our Climate Matters met, if you didn't get a chance to check it out yet, we did a real focus on Earth Day this week. And it started with the beginning with your state temperature trend from 1970 on, since the first Earth Day. And the other thing we wanted to do is really do a deep dive into one aspect of climate change that we're hearing a lot about, and that's the ocean. So we did an animation that really highlights where a lot of our Earth's energy, excuse me, where a lot of the incoming energy is going in our Earth system. And you can see that on the upper left-hand corner, where's the heat? This is an animation that you can pull and put on air and use via social media. And on the bottom right-hand corner, that was a universal CONUS trend since 1970 on, but also this was paired with your state trend. So take a look at that, and if you have any questions at all, you can reach out to us. We'll again show you our emails at the end. I am bplackey at climatecentral.org, and Sean is ssublette at climatecentral.org. Now, with no further delay, want to introduce our featured guest of the month. We've got Richard Somerville. He is joining us from Scripps, and also the University of California at San Diego. He has his background in meteorology and then expanded into climate science, and he is joining us today to really break up down the history of climate change. Some people think it's a younger science than it really is, and the understanding of the Earth system and the climate system. And he's going to take us back a little bit farther and through the steps that got us to where we are today and what we're looking at for the years to come. So at this point, I would like to hand this over to Richard Somerville. Okay, great. Well, first of all, uh, sorry for the glitch, everybody, but I'm really glad to be with you. And as Bernadette says, I'm actually a meteorologist. A lot of climate scientists come from physics and astronomy and math, and but my degrees are in meteorology, and uh, my bachelor's degree is from Penn State, and uh, so my first job uh, in college was as a weather observer at the airport in Washington, D.C. I can actually read a weather map, and that's something that uh, many uh, climate scientists can't say. And what I want to do this morning is, uh, it's morning here on the West Coast, uh, what I want to do today is uh, take you through a few of the important developments in the science of climate change, because I think not everybody realizes that this science goes back uh, more than 200 years. It's got roots um, back uh, to 1800. And uh, I want to begin by uh, talking about this person here, William Herschel, who was an interesting guy. I'm going to mention uh, four scientists of the past, and Herschel's the first of them. And all of them were both uh, amazing scientists and very interesting as human beings, too. Herschel was born in Germany, and he was first a musician. He made his living uh, playing instruments. He was versatile. He was a skilled performer on the harpsichord and the violin and the oboe and the organ. And he composed many symphonies. And he emigrated to England at the age of 19, quickly became fluent in English, and then in middle life, he made his living for a long time as a musician, but then in middle life, he became interested in astronomy. And he built many telescopes himself. He actually built 400 telescopes during his lifetime. He made many discoveries. He is the person who discovered uh, the planet Uranus, which was the first planet uh, discovered in modern times. All the, the, the nearer planets had been known to the ancients, but uh, Herschel got famous for discovering Uranus, and he, he cataloged stars and studied double stars and uh, for a long time uh, occupied himself with uh, observational astronomy. And by accident, he discovered infrared radiation, or what was known in those days as radiant heat. So next slide. Uh, <clears throat> he did an experiment. And what you're looking at here is a photograph 
of a modern reproduction of his experiment. On the colors on the right, you can see uh, those are the colors of the rainbow, the colors that make up white light. And uh, he uh, created those colors experimentally just by using a simple glass prism, which, as you know, breaks up uh, light into its different wavelengths. And uh, you can see it going top to bottom, red, orange, yellow, green, uh, indigo, blue, violet. And uh, Herschel uh, was interested in making filters to the, for sunlight so he could observe the sun with his telescopes. And uh, so he arranged uh, this little experiment with the thermometers there. It's a modern reconstruction of, uh, of his experiment. But the thermometers there, you can see there's three of them. And he put the bulbs of the thermometers, which were painted black so they'd absorb energy, in the uh, different regions of that spectrum. And the one on the top, he had off above the spectrum, he was going to just use that to, uh, as a control to uh, measure the temperature that was in uh, the, uh, in the ambient uh, air at that time. And uh, he was surprised to find that the thermometer that, that read the highest during this experiment was that one on the top, which during the experiment was outside the spectrum. It looked like it wasn't getting any uh, light at all. And then he realized that what was happening was that the spectrum was wider than the spectrum of the colors that he saw, and that there was something beyond the red. And that's what, what we now call infrared energy, and what or other people would say heat energy. It's an important part of the solar spectrum, and uh, it's like that we can't see with our eyes. You could see it with an infrared camera or something like that. And so he realized what had happened was that the part of the spectrum that he could see with his eyes with those colors was simply only one part of the spectrum and that there was another part that was off to the, uh, beyond the red. And as we know, there's, there's more radiation the other side of the, of the blue as well. So Herschel discovered infrared energy and at that time, this was 1800, um, it was completely unknown. It was totally not understood at all. And I think it was very mysterious to scientists of that day in the same way that uh, dark matter might be to, to scientists today. And it caught the attention of many, many scientists who began to wonder what it was, uh, how powerful it was, what effect it had. And that leads us to the next uh, character in the story, next slide, who is John Tyndall. Tyndall was an Irishman. He was uh, born in the early 1800s, and he came from a very poor uh, family. He uh, never went to, uh, to college. Uh, his, his father was a constable. Uh, and he was interested in science, but he was not really trained in science. And he trained in, instead as a land surveyor and worked as a surveyor for some time. And then in his 20s, he got interested in science and decided he ought to go and study it formally. And uh, with very little background at all, he'd never been to a university. Tyndall went to Germany, uh, which was at that time the leading uh, scientific center in Europe, and got a PhD in physics. It's kind of hard to imagine somebody going to get a doctor's degree in physics today who had never even been to college, but he did that. He learned German. He was a compulsive worker all his life. He worked very, very hard. And uh, he came back to, uh, to England and got a job at the Royal Institution in London, where he was not only a fine physicist, but also a very popular lecturer. He was sort of uh, the Carl Sagan of his day, you might say. And uh, he was uh, a, a famous guy. He, he entertained uh, London society by teaching them physics. And he got interested in infrared energy and decided he wanted to find out uh, what it was and how it worked um, in the atmosphere, because he knew that uh, the sunlight was absorbed by some gases but he didn't know very much about that, and he did it experimentally. He really put the greenhouse effect on a firm uh, empirical foundation. And on the next slide, you see a picture of the instrument that he used. I've actually seen this instrument. Uh, it showed up uh, at, a, at a conference we held a couple of years ago uh, to celebrate the 150th anniversary of his discoveries. And uh, I asked the people who had brought it over from London, how did you find this stuff? Uh, Back, back from the middle 1800s, and they said, well, every time they got a new superintendent at the Royal Institution of London, he put his predecessor's stuff in a closet and uh, made room in the lab for his own stuff, and we just went to the closet. And so it really does look like this. This looks like a schematic diagram, but it's an accurate, almost photographic sketch. 
And that long horizontal tube you see in the middle uh, was filled by pumps and so on with different gases. And then Tyndall uh, had a, a, a gadget with a flame on it. You can see one of them on the far left and used that to uh, send heat down through the tube. And he measured how much of the uh, energy was absorbed. And he found to his surprise that the gases that make up almost all of the atmosphere, nitrogen and oxygen, didn't absorb infrared radiation at all, but that those trace gases that were present in very small quantities like carbon dioxide and water vapor were very powerful absorbers of infrared energy. He published this in 1861, and uh, he realized immediately that uh, this might have consequences for the climate. He was actually interested not in human-caused climate change, but in what makes the ice ages come and go. And he thought, well, if you could just change the amount of the chemicals in the atmosphere, these trace gases like carbon dioxide that were powerful infrared absorbers, if you could reduce the amount of CO2, you'd cool the atmosphere. If you could increase the amount of CO2, you'd warm the atmosphere. And he thought this might be very important to ice ages and the transitions between ice ages and interglacial times. And in fact, we now know that he was right about that, that ice ages and their comings and goings are triggered by changes in the Earth's orbit. But then the CO2 in the atmosphere changes in response to that, and that uh, helps amplify the, uh, the transition of ice ages and interglacial uh, transitions. It contributes about 30% to the heating and cooling that's, that's started by the changes in the Earth's orbit. So it became clear that it was possible to change the climate if you change the amount of these heat trapping gases like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And in fact, calculations were done in the 1900s uh, by others, notably Arrhenius, um, late in the, in the 1800s. He was no slouch either. He was a, later a Nobel laureate in chemistry. But he did the first calculations of how sensitive the climate should be to the changes in the amount of carbon dioxide. And his answers, although these were hand calculations, he didn't have the modern tools at his disposal, no computers, no quantum mechanics. He is within a factor of two um, of modern estimates of the sensitivity of climate to carbon dioxide. And that brings us to the third scientist I want to mention. The next slide. This is Charles David Keeling. I actually knew him very well. He spent his whole career at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego, which is where I work. And I uh, knew him well from basically um, 1980 until his death in 2005, so the last 25 years of his life or so. Keeling was a fascinating human being, like Herschel and like Tyndall. He was a man of many parts. He was also a skilled musician, almost made a career as a concert pianist, uh, decided to go into uh, atmospheric chemistry instead. And he, while still in his 20s, invented the first instrument that could measure carbon dioxide amount in the atmosphere accurately. It's his own invention he designed and built uh, the instrument itself, and uh, he came to Scripps in the late 1950s and as a postdoctoral fellow, sort of the lowest uh, man on the academic totem pole, and he set up his instrument as part of the Inter International Geophysical Year uh, on the side of a, of, a, of a Hawaiian volcano, Mauna Loa, where there was already an observatory run by the predecessors of NOAA. And uh, you can see the observatory there, and Keeling um, measured the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere essentially continuously uh, beginning in 1958. And at the lower left, you can see the graph there, uh, which is uh, carbon dioxide amount or concentration in the atmosphere on the vertical scale and time on the horizontal scale beginning in 1958 and extending uh, for the first uh, decade or decade and a half or so. And these units, which are parts per million by volume, it's a rare gas. So these, these are equivalent to molecules per million molecules. The first dot there is about 314, it turns out. That means that at that time, if you took a million molecules of air and could analyze them, 314 out of that million would be carbon dioxide. So it's a very rare gas. But as you can see, it goes up. And uh, the rise uh, is due to human activities entirely. There's no natural cause that makes uh, CO2 go up. And you can see also there's annual variations there. And Keeling uh, figured out what caused them too. They're due to the biosphere breathing. The, uh, in the spring when, uh, when plants put out leaves and start to photosynthesize, uh, 
uh, you see the, they draw down the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. In the fall, when the plants respire, the leaves fall off, the carbon dioxide goes back into the atmosphere. So the annual cycle is due to the, the biogeochemistry of the atmosphere, to, the, to basically photosynthesis and respiration, and the rise is due to human activities. And Keeling figured out how to make this instrument about 10 times more accurate than he thought it needed to be. And we've learned a great deal from these uh, data since then. The next slide shows what that graph looks like today. And uh, you can see that the number that was around 314 on the left in 1958 is now around 400 uh, today. So we've seen an increase of uh, something like close to 30% uh, in the time that we've been making these measurements, Keeling passed away in 2005. The measurements are carried on um, at Scripps by a group led by his son, Ralph Keeling, and is also carried on globally. And so you see measurements like this at several stations around the world. But what Keeling understood was that carbon dioxide, once it's in the atmosphere, stays there for a long time. Some of it stays there for centuries. And so that's plenty of time for the winds to mix it around. So for climate purposes, the concentration or the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is about the same everywhere. It's uh, higher where there's industrial sources, for example. But in the free atmosphere, in the unpolluted, pristine atmosphere, it's about the same everywhere. So if you have accurate measurements at one case, at one place, in, in this case Mauna Loa, they're representative of the concentration uh, all over the world. So. You have in these three men here, Herschel and Tyndall and Keeling, you have the foundations of our current understanding of how human activities can change the climate. Herschel discovered infrared radiation. Uh, Tyndall found out that uh, with laboratory experiments that uh, infrared radiation could be absorbed in the atmosphere by trace gases, notably carbon dioxide and water vapor. Today we say that carbon dioxide is the most important of these because even though water vapor absorbs more infrared energy than the CO2 does, the amount of water vapor is largely controlled by the temperature because uh, for you meteorologists, the saturation vapor pressure goes up strongly with temperature. That's the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. And so you can't have uh, the atmosphere having uh, wildly different amounts of water vapor except that the temperature controls it. So there's much more water vapor in warm parts of the atmosphere, much less in cold parts of the atmosphere. That brings me to the fourth person here, which is a hero uh, in meteorology that many people uh, uh, know about. Lewis Fry Richardson was an Englishman who was trained in uh, physics and mathematics at Cambridge and who had a remarkable career. He was in several different fields at various times. But around the time of World War I, he got interested in the idea that you could make weather forecasts scientifically, not just by rules of thumb, but you could predict the weather from physics as an initial value problem. If you could observe the initial state and you could write down the equations that govern uh, how the initial state will evolve, uh, then you could, uh, with sufficient computing power, uh, compute uh, the, for the weather from the future. That was a remarkable uh, kind of thing to be thinking about in, around World War I because in the first place, the equations weren't well known. He helped to develop them. And secondly, the computing power would be uh, extraordinary. There were no computers then. So in fact, the word computer in those times meant a person who was doing uh, hand calculations. And so Richardson um, actually wrote a book uh, about his research. He, he, he did the research during World War I, and he was an interesting guy. He was a devout Quaker, a pacifist, whose religious convictions meant that he could not join the army in World War I. But he was still fascinated by war, so he got a job driving an ambulance um, in Europe, on the front in France, actually. And in between trips to the front carrying wounded soldiers back, he did these calculations by hand. They were lost, later found, and he published them in 1922. And the book has uh, been reprinted several times. It's a weather prediction by numerical process. It was the, one of the first textbooks, you might say, in modern meteorology. The calculations that he did were erroneous because he didn't uh, know the equations well, he didn't have a good numerical scheme for solving them, and he uh, didn't uh, have observations well enough to define the initial state. But in fact, all those conditions were changed uh, by after World War II, and the next slide shows a picture of the computer that was used to make the first successful large-scale numerical weather prediction in 1950. This is the ENIAC, uh, 
And it was a huge machine, took up a room, uh, had 17,000 vacuum tubes, uh, consumed 150 kilowatts of power, and still took 24 hours to make a 24-hour forecast with a simple uh, barotropic uh, model. Today, by the way, that forecast has been replicated. I'll show you in the next picture here. The next slide, that was this same model was that had been used in 1950 to make the first numerical weather prediction was reprogrammed a few years ago by an Irish meteorologist named Lynch uh, on a cell phone. And uh, the cell phone uh, did the calculation that had taken the ENIAC 24 hours in about one second. So it was almost 100,000 times faster uh, than the ENIAC. In fact, you could do the calculation on a modern laptop in about a millisecond. So it tells you something about how the growth of computer power has, has helped our field. And these weather forecasts, they became operational in this country in 1955 and other countries soon after are now the foundation of climate models. And I'm not going to talk a great deal about climate models, but I'll show you a couple slides. The next slide. Uh, this is uh, from the uh, fourth uh, uh, IPCC assessment report. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental on Climate Change, was started in 1988 to provide uh, information on climate science to policymakers in a way that's relevant to policy but not prescriptive of policy. And there have been five reports to date. The first four are known as the FAR, the first assessment report, the SAR, the second assessment report, the TAR, so the FAR, the SAR, and the TAR. And then you can't keep on using that because fourth and fifth also start with F, so it's switched to AR4 and AR5. But I've shown here on a, on a photo taken, sorry, a, a picture taken from the fourth assessment report, um, I've shown an illustration of how computing power has let the resolution of these models improve. So at the top picture there, you see the coarse grid of uh, models that were typical of those climate models that were used in, in the first report in 1990. It's a 500-kilometer grid. Uh, you can see uh, that's Europe with a, a handful of spaces for the Mediterranean. And then you can see the improvement in resolution. Uh, these reports come out about every six years. And you can see the improvement, 250 kilometers in the second report, 180 kilometers in the third report, 110 kilometers in the fourth report, as a typical grid for the climate models of that day. IPCC doesn't do research. It just assesses the published research. But you can see that the grid resolution has changed remarkably, as it has in operational numerical weather prediction, driven uh, pretty much entirely by the by Moore's law, by the uh, speed up of, of computers. And in fact, at the same time, next slide, you can see that the models have been uh, uh, changing physically too. And so here in the mid 1970s, top left panel, the uh, climate model was really a very simple um, atmospheric model, essentially a simple numerical weather prediction model with a coarse resolution so it could run for, um, for months and years and decades rather than just for the days of a weather forecast and with a prescribed amount of, of CO2 and a simple hydrological cycle, that's the rain. And then if you look at the other panels um, on the top right, you see mid-1980s with slightly more atmospheric physics. And then on the middle left, the, at the time of the first assessment report, that was 1990, uh, the ocean was uh, represented in a global climate model just by a body of water that didn't move, but that could, uh, could absorb heat and uh, evaporate water. And then the next three panels uh, show the way in which the physical complexity of climate models has increased. So my message here is that it took computer power plus a lot of uh, theoretical work and a lot of observational work uh, to create a modern climate model. And now you can see what these models are capable of uh, today. And the next slide uh, is a picture from the National Climate Assessment, which came out last year, which is available free online. It's the third NCA, the third National Climate Assessment. It's beautifully written. It's beautifully illustrated. It has English units rather than metric units, so it's appropriate for an American audience. And here on the left, you see what the climate near the end of the current century might be in the United States in terms of warming. And on the right, the very different climate that might be the case if emissions of heat trapping gases were lower or higher. So. Basically, on the right is business as usual, with uh, more and more people using more and more fossil fuels uh, for energy, emitting more and more carbon dioxide. And on the left, the result that might happen if there was a serious effort made to lower emissions. So this is designed to inform the public and policymakers about uh, future climates. And there's lots and lots of these kinds of projections made with present-day models. Next slide, I'll show you one more. Is the example of 
of changes in precipitation near, near the end of the present century if uh, uh, the high emission scenario is what happens. Here, uh, the green or teal color means more precipitation, the brown means less. And so you can see at the lower right, for example, that uh, the northeastern United States, particularly the northern tier in general, uh, has more precipitation. And if you look on the top right panel, you see that in spring, uh, there's increased um, uh, drought or aridity uh, in the southwest. And as you may know, uh, the present uh, trends in climate change in recent decades have been um, in keeping with these projections. So I think that what we're looking at if we take a, a bird's eye view of the whole history of climate science is this early work uh, done uh, by people like Herschel and Tyndall and Richardson and Keeling, uh, and then turned into modern climate science because of a great deal more research by many other people and I would say two huge technological developments. One, the development of supercomputers, digital electronic computers that uh, are now capable of doing high resolution, uh, physically comprehensive climate models. And secondly, satellite data. And I've, I'm gonna close with a couple of pictures of, of satellite uh, data. Here you see what was a surprise to the climate modeling community after the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the fourth assessment report of the IPCC and came out in early 2007 we found that uh, in the fall of 2007, which is the time of year when Arctic sea ice reaches its annual minimum, the minimum was extremely low, far lower than had been predicted. And in general, we're now seeing Arctic sea ice extent like the picture on the right, which is from 2012, which is roughly half the extent that it had been before about 2000. So on the left is 1984, a typical year before, uh, a typical year before 2000. On the right, a typical year after 2000. And we've had these kinds of satellite data roughly since the era of Nimbus 7, starting around 1979. So we have the global coverage for many things, not just visual images like this, but in the next uh, picture, next graph, uh, you see here satellite data for ice loss from two uh, large ice sheets, the one in Greenland on top, one in Antarctic on the bottom. In 2007, we didn't know when the IPCC was writing its uh, fourth assessment report that came out in 2007, we weren't even sure whether the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica were gaining mass from increased snowfall or losing mass from melting and from icebergs calving off. Now we know that both of them are, gaining, are losing mass and contributing to sea level rise. And that's because of many uh, technological advances, but especially um, satellite data the mass loss comes, for example, from the GRACE satellite, a, a pair of satellites uh, with an accurate measurement of the distance between them, which changes as the satellites pass over gravity anomalies and is sensitive enough so that it can detect uh, changes in ice mass. So that was all I really wanted to, to say, to uh, just put a little bit of modern science in historical context. In the next slide, um, I'm going to recommend uh, three um, websites uh, to all of you. The top one I have nothing to do with. It's a site maintained by John Cook from Australia. And what he's done has, is to have taken many, many uh, of what I'm calling climate myths, that is, allegations or claims about climate that just uh, aren't true, and uh, he's given the refutations of them. So if uh, somebody uh, shows up in, at your Thanksgiving dinner and spoils the meal by saying, well, you know, uh, all this climate change is just due to variations in the sun. Well, that's not true, and that's we know that because we can measure the output of the sun and so on, and it's, uh, the changes in the sun are small compared to the climate changes due to carbon dioxide. So you can take the whole list of, of common mistaken claims that are sometimes made and, uh, and see the refutations of them uh, at skepticalscience.com. It's searchable. It's a lovely site. Uh, there are different statements uh, they're appropriate for different uh, ages or education levels of audiences and so on. And the lower two uh, uh, links that I'm giving there are websites that I have a connection with. Climatecommunication.org is the website um, of uh, my partner in this work, Susan Joy Hassel, who is an expert on climate communication. And it's got a lot of useful uh, hints about how to communicate this well. One of the things that Susan Hassel and I have done is put on workshops at universities and research centers to help scientists uh, speak uh, in a more intelligible way, without uh, jargon, without caveats, without lots of metric units, but to speak in an intelligible way. Uh, and so to teach them to speak better when they're 
talking to journalists, when they're testifying to Congress, when they're giving public uh, talks. And uh, we've got lots of uh, helpful material on that website, including uh, many animations. And richardsomerville.com, as uh, I would like to immodestly suggest, is worth your attention to. There's many, many links and, and downloads on that, uh, that site as well. And uh, Bernadette, that's, uh, that's my time limit, and that's all I wanted to say, and I'd be glad to take questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Richard. That was great. And it's great to hear the story behind the science, too. I think that really helps resonate with people. Well, there's a couple of questions that we started to have from our side here at Climate Central that we'll get into. But before we do, just want to throw it out there for everyone. With your questions, could you please chat them to myself so that we can read them? We've kept everyone on mute because we've had some problems with that in the past. So if you can chat them to the presenter, then we will have them and we can share them with the group. So while we're allowing people to chat in some of those questions, a few things that arose from our side, again, presented this so nicely, Richard, um, we went through the history. And one thing that I've heard people talk about sometimes too is that the reliability of the history of records, especially since satellites came on at a later time. Um, in the Arctic, or even with just our temperature records, since some of the placement of where we take the temperatures has changed over time and all of that, and just the broad concept of the history of our records. Do you think you could speak a little bit to that, um, telling everyone sort of the reliability of it, how that's progressed, and, and where things stand? Sure, I'll be glad to, to speak to that. One could say a great many things, but I, I think, uh, uh, sometimes you will hear people say that because of uh, instrument changes or, as you said, sighting changes, uh, the record could be contaminated by artifacts. So, for example, if the thermometer stayed in one place and the city grew up so the thermometer long ago was out in the outskirts and, uh, and today is in the heart of the city, uh, it could be contaminated by essentially the urban heat island effect. And I think the right answer to that is to say that there's been an enormous amount of careful work by people like scientists at NCDC, the National Climate Data Center of NOAA in Asheville, North Carolina, who have uh, gone out and done careful comparisons and compared, for example, the trend of urban thermometers with the trend of rural thermometers, and also compared the land temperature record with the ocean temperature record. There aren't any urban heat islands in the ocean, and so the, uh, the ocean, which is 70% of the Earth's surface, is also warming. And uh, rural areas are warming as fast as urban areas. So I would say that it's a perfectly legitimate concern, but it's been answered. And uh, we now know that we can trust things like the global average temperature record back into the 1800s. As you get further back, uh, you get, of course, um, more sparse data and more erroneous data. But I would say that the reanalyses that have been done of that data mean that back into the late 1800s, you can create a meaningful uh, global average surface atmospheric temperature record. And of course, for some variables, it's less valid. I mean, we didn't have uh, satellites, and there are probably lots of undetected hurricanes uh, in 100 years ago that we would now be able to detect. But I think that enough good work has been done so that you can put aside the question, is the world really warming? And you can answer it definitively, yes, unambiguously, unequivocally, as the IPCC term, we know that the world is warming. Thank you. Um, another question we had here, too, as we've sort of gone over a brief history of climate change, looking ahead to the future, a few things we'd like to talk about. Uh, one, what's happening in Paris to the next round of climate models, and overall, some of your impressions on the future of climate change. So I know those are each big topic, so we can take them one by one. Um, but you did touch on some of the history of climate models and modeling in general of the atmosphere uh, with the next round of the IPCC starting to get underway. Um, what, is, what does the next round of climate models look like? What are the re resolutions, new boundaries, the parameters being added? I think that uh, uh, climate modeling right now is in a very healthy uh, state. You know, uh, I'm, my career goes back to the times of the first uh, uh, GCM, the first general circulation models or global climate models, which were atmospheric models in the 1960s. My, I 
started at Penn State as a meteorology student in 1958. At that time, people didn't think this problem was taken seriously. If you go back and look at the textbooks of that time, like the Compendium of Meteorology that the AMS published in 1950, you'll find they dismissed the idea that, uh, that carbon dioxide emissions can change the climate. But we've learned a lot more since then. A lot of ideas were erroneous at that time. People thought, for example, the oceans would take up all the CO2 that, that uh, humankind could emit or that the absorption bands of CO2 were already saturated because of water vapor. We now know that uh, isn't true. A lot of fundamental science uh, uh, has been done since then, and that leads to this very strong scientific consensus you see today among uh, those people actually doing research in this area that the world is unequivocally warming and that the human activities are a primary cause of that. So I think uh, in terms of what's going to happen in Paris, that's an interesting story, um, but uh, we'll wait and see. I think uh, it's harder to, to predict what the political process will do, but clearly there's a lot of momentum now, and the U.S. and other countries uh, have made tentative commitments. But as everybody knows, this is a contentious issue politically, and so I think we have to wait and see. I will be at the uh, at COP21, the Conference of the Parties uh, in Paris, in late November and early December of of this year, like many people, I'll be interested to see what happens. But climate modeling itself is in a very good state right now. We're seeing a lot of developments in many areas. There's more attention to very high resolution models. Um, I've been involved with, with uh, people looking at multi-scale models in which you uh, make, uh, do away with the need for, for complicated statistical parameterizations by embedding high resolution cloud resolving models inside the the uh, uh, computational grid spaces of, of global models. There's a great deal of work going on in better representations of clouds and aerosols and air-sea interactions, all these um, detailed physical processes that have a strong influence on climate. And there's enough computer power now that many different centers are running these models and we're able to run large ensembles of runs. So I think the climate modeling area itself is in a very active, uh, healthy state of development. And you spoke somewhat to the role of oceans. As we know, that is a huge part of our globe. It drives, it helps to drive a lot of our weather patterns and the entire climate system. And there's been a lot of talk recently sort of to this slowdown of warming in the atmospheric temperature, but we've seen the role of the oceans taking on so much of this heat. Could you talk a little bit more to that on the, the role of the oceans and where we see this going in the future? And, and there's been also talk of maybe a rapid uptick in warming when it starts to release the heat. And, and what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I think uh, you've summarized it very well. Uh, upwards of 90% of the heat that has been gained by the climate system uh, in recent decades due to, to the addition of heat trapping gases mainly to the atmosphere, up to more than 90% of that heat is stored in the ocean. And it used to be true that the atmosphere was monitored, um, but the ocean was only sampled by infrequent research cruises. But we can now observe the ocean much better, and there's now a, a, a flotilla of 3,500 autonomous floats, uh, the Argo floats, A-R-G-O, uh, which are in all the world's oceans and which uh, sink to a prescribed depth, take measurements, pop to the surface, transmit the data to satellite, and sink again. It's a huge international effort. And that's one of the reasons that we're monitoring the heat content of the ocean. And the Argo uh, fleet is, is being expanded now to go deeper than before. But most of that heat is in the upper ocean. And it's, uh, it is uh, in large part responsible for the uh, so-called hiatus or pause uh, in surface temperature uh, rises. It's true that uh, since 1998, there has been less of warming, but all the warmest years um, have been recent years, and so there's no doubt that the warming is continuing, but it's apparently the interdecadal Pacific Oscillation, which has different names, but is a natural uh, cycle uh, that's responsible for a lot of that, and as that changes phase, we will expect to see a return to the uh, rapid warming, more rapid warming in the atmosphere. So I think uh, those those things are going on, and I'll mention one other uh, interesting piece of research that happened last year where a group uh, led by Eric Rignot, R-I-G-N-O-T, of Jet Propulsion Lab and the University of California, Irvine, announced that part of the West Antarctic ice sheet had begun unstoppable collapse. And that was due uh, to uh, uh, warm water 
uh, going under the icy, relatively warm water. In the Antarctic, nothing's really hot, you know. But there's uh, an instability that had been understood for a long time that if uh, the ice sheet was grounded on a on land that sloped downwards towards the continental interior, then you could create an instability if uh, if warmer water began to melt that from below. That's again a triumph of satellite remote sensing. They can tell where the grounding line is that separates the floating ice uh, shelf from the interior ice sheet uh, by satellite altimetry because the part that's floating is moving up and down with the tides, the part that's grounded on land is not. And we see an acceleration of the retreat of those uh, glaciers that over a time that may be measured in centuries, might be two, three more centuries, um, will lead to a, a very strong rise in global average sea level. And so that's uh, in, indeed ascribable uh, to ocean warming. So the ocean is a critically important uh, part of the climate system. Aside from the, that fact, of course, we know it's acidifying as well, which has, because CO2 is being absorbed in the ocean. And that has potentially profound consequences for marine life. But the ocean is a critically important part of the climate system for sure. And I think these recent developments illustrate that. Okay, we got a question from Steve Tracton. And first of all, he says, hi, Richard, long time no see. <laughs> I have no question that climate change, aka global warming, is occurring and that it will result in significant changes to virtually everyone and everything climate dependent. But I'm extremely skeptical about that we have or perhaps may never have or how these changes will manifest via current or prospective climate models. I see no possible improvement in modeling that can ever adequately simulate the multitude of interactions operating nonlinearly by way of example, Arctic warming, mid-latitudes, and its consequent effects on jet streams, for example, until after it began about 2000. Well, I think Steve Trachten puts his finger on an important point there, which is that nobody experiences the global average. We, we experience what happens where we are and, and when we are there. And so the effect that climate change has on people, on ecosystems, on the economy is extremely complex and will vary a great deal uh, from place to place. And I agree it's an enormous challenge to think of incorporating all that in a model. I think what the model does is it gives you the big picture, the background picture, and then from that you get to think about what the consequences might be. So for example, we know that, uh, that sea level is rising. That's pretty simple. Sea level rises because the ocean expands thermally, and sea level rises because ice on land melts, and there's more consequences to it. We measure the fact that sea level is rising. And we also know that there's more water vapor in the atmosphere. That's because warm air, if you like to put it simply, holds more water than cool air. But also we measure the fact that the absolute humidity, the amount of water in the atmosphere, has risen. So those are empirical facts. We measure sea level rising, the rate of rise is accelerating. And we measure the fact that water vapor in the atmosphere is, uh, is more plentiful now than it was a few decades ago. Those are just empirical facts. You can argue all you want. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but not to their own facts, and those are facts. And then the question of, of what the effects of those might be is extremely complex, and I would very much agree that we don't yet have models that begin to approach the necessary complexity to work through all the consequences of that. So for example, for land falling hurricanes, the big source of damage is often flooding from the ocean, from the storm surge. And that means if the sea level is higher, other things being equal, there's more potential for damage from that. There's a second big cause of damage from land falling hurricanes is that there's more freshwater flooding, which means there's more severe rainfall, and the greater availability of water vapor in the atmosphere can contribute to that. But I think to ask a model to go uh, through the details of that and to figure out what changes you'd expect to see in comparison with natural variability of, of hurricane damage, I think that's really beyond the state of the art. And it may be many years before we have, since hurricanes fortunately are relatively rare, before we have enough empirical observations. So I think what you're trying to do is use models sensibly to help guide research and to help people who want to, to take action about this. For example, if you're concerned with, with the infrastructure along shorelines, uh, then I think the, the science can provide one of the inputs uh, to sound policy. But to think that you're going to capture all the complexities of the climate system on all spatial and temporal scales and all phenomena uh, 
I think uh, that's a very tall order. I've often said that climate science is like medical science. It's imperfect. Medical science hasn't yet cured all diseases, but it's still very useful. And I think that's the way to think about it. Imperfect, but useful. Well, thank you. Um, we have another question here. Um, with everything going on with climate change, so many different elements and aspects of it, what piques your interest most in the area of research right now? What, when it comes across your desk, you have to read right away? What area of research in climate change? Oh, wow. That's a wonderful question. I'm interested in lots of things that I don't actually work in, so that I'm, I'm interested in them uh, just <laughs> because they're fascinated scientifically rather than there's something that I'm actually working on myself right now. But um, I, these days, I'm very much interested in the oceans and, and the ice, you might say. I think that uh, I've cited several examples of those, and I think those are exciting areas uh, to work on. And I'm also interested in the high-resolution uh, climate modeling. Um, you know, we've, uh, we're at the point now where you can think of having variable resolution models with higher resolution uh, where you need it. I think that's also important in numerical weather prediction. but in in, uh, in climate modeling, I think it's uh, it's really very 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 important. And one thing that fascinates me a great deal that I think we're learning much more about is paleoclimate. Is learning from the climate changes of the distant geological past what the system is capable of. And one reason we know why sea level can change, for example, is that the record tells us that in between ice ages and interglacial periods. Sea level did change, and the global average change wasn't a few inches. It was more like 100 meters, or to upwards of 300 feet. And so I'm uh, fascinated by the lessons we can draw from, uh, from paleoclimate research. And I think this is an area uh, where tremendous advances have been made. For, for example, we know how much carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere in, uh, long before Keeling started his measurements because there's fossil air trapped uh, in the ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica, and you can core it and date it and analyze it in the laboratory. So we know that that number that's 400 today and that was 314 in 1958 was around 280 uh, in the 1800s. And uh, to me, that's a remarkable technological development that, from which we learn a great deal. Well, thank you very much, and I think we're coming up on our hour here, and this is a great discussion, so thank you so much for joining us. That uh, paleo comment at the end, I think, just inspired a future webinar that we're going to try and put together here, too. And for those of you who are on the phone, if you have any topics you would like us to dive deeper into, feel free to approach us with those ideas, because we love taking on these different topics and really learning more about what's going on with our climate system here. So thank you so much, Richard. We really appreciate it. For all of those out there, if you would like to, again, learn more about Climate Central or Climate Matters, feel free to reach out to myself or Sean Sublette. These are our emails on the left. A little bit small, but <laughs> bplackey at climatecentral.org. And Sean is on the right. He is S. Sublette at climatecentral.org. So thank you very much for joining us today, everybody, and happy Earth Day. Have a good one.